So hi, I'm Tim Titus, uh, CTO of Pass Solutions. I'd like to show you a demo of what we can do with TotalView with root cause troubleshooting. Uh, so let me dive in and show you how this works. So the solution is an 80 megabyte installer. That's megabytes, not gigabytes. This will install on any Windows operating system, uh, even Windows 10. If you want to use this on a laptop and, and be able to troubleshoot customer networks, you can do that as well. When it installs, what it's going to do is it's going to scan through your network and find all of your switches, routers, gateways, firewalls. It's going to use SNMP, V1, V2C, V3, as well as the high encryption available for V3 on the Cisco devices like Triple Des or AES-192 or AES-256. As we find devices, we're going to immediately start automatically collecting information from those devices and analyzing all of that information to say, let's find some problems. Let's find out what these devices know that we should know. Within the first hour, it's going to start to put some red dots in front of devices. We can see here that the Syrah switch has a red dot. We can click into that device, and we're going to see all of the interfaces. Here we see interface 5 has a red dot, and oops, sorry. Interface 5 has a red dot and 4% packet loss. Now, if I told you, hey, we found packet loss on a switch port, I think most of you would say, well, I, I don't know if I care, because if that's a printer or a photocopier, most people really, they couldn't care less. But if this is a trunk port to another switch, or there's a critical voice device plugged in here, or there's a firewall connected here, then you do care about it. So to help answer the question of what is affected by this packet loss, we expose all of the CDP and LLDP information that the switch has to share. We also have a fully integrated bridge table. Here we can see that connected to that interface 5, there's one MAC address, so it's not a trunk port to another switch. There's an individual device connected. That individual device associates with the HQ voice VLAN, VLAN number 110. We see the MAC address, we see the manufacturer and say, oh, this is some sort of Dell computer. We have the IP address and the reverse DNS lookup. Now, recognizing that this is our voicemail recording server, that means that we're going to have choppy sounding voicemails with packet loss to that server. Okay, so that's telling us that this is a high priority problem. Let's go see what the problem is. We click into the interface and we see the utilization graph. Below that, we see the packet loss graph. And then below that, the plain English prescription. And here we're being told we should be looking for a cabling fault. So it's that fast and easy to recognize we have a problem on the Sara switch, we have a problem on interface 5, the problem relates to packet loss, it affects this voicemail server, here's when the problem started, here's when the problem stopped, and here's what the problem is. Now, as you can see here, the point is this problem can be pushed down as low as the help desk. That means that instead of having seasoned senior level engineers working on these tickets, they can have the help desk fix many of these problems because it's been pre-found and pre-diagnosed. What we found to be missing in the market is a lot of other monitoring software packages might not even monitor this interface. Even if they do monitor this interface, they might not be aware of the problem. Here's why. If you click on view error counters, it's going to show you all 19 of the error counters that we're picking up on this interface. Other monitoring products would only look at inbound errors and outbound errors, and therefore they would declare the interface as healthy. Because we're looking at all 19 of the error counters, we're going to say, no, actually the truth is you've got a ton of FCS errors, some deferred transmissions, and some outbound discards. And by the way, Here's what all of this means based upon the interface type and the configuration. You've got a cabling fault. Hey, Tim, quick question on those 19 errors. Are those the Armon errors that come as those standard SNMP Armon errors? Nope, no, nope, they're, they're not Armon. What they are is they're the um, Ether-like errors. If the, if the interface is an Ether-like uh, interface, then it's going to support all of these other error counters. OK, so I think what you were saying before was you know, other monitoring systems are just looking at, say, the IFX table, you know, the few errors, but there's another MIB that 
all vendor support called ether like table or something that comes most most all vendors do support which is effectively if it's an ether like type of interface then under the transmission group mm -hmm. uh under, under transmission you'll find serial interfaces token ring interfaces all of the different historic ones but the ether like ends up having all of these error counters that says here's what's actually going on with the interface and so we determine does the device support these MIBs does it support these these OIDs and then if it does let's get them so that we get more of the truth about what's going on and I assume you can use the same information for detecting duplex mismatch yep yep um so the other thing is is if you want to learn about what an error counter is uh we've built in an engineer's library just click on the error counter. It's going to give you the official IEEE definition, a more basic lay definition, and then all of the different causes as to where that can come from. So this way, you don't need to go out and search Google or Wikipedia to learn about it. All the information is brought to bear. So the trick really is, is that with all of these error counters collected on every interface of the network at every five minute period, what this means is, if you drop or buffer even a single packet anywhere in the network, any point in time for any reason, we know when, where, and why that occurred. So let's put this together and do a root cause troubleshoot. Let's say we had a problem with a user that said right before noon, they were doing unified communication from their desktop and they said, hey, we've, we had this really bad video and audio artifact. What happened? I can put in the IP address of their PC put in the IP address of the other PC or the gateway they are connecting to and click map. This is going to evaluate routing tables, bridge tables, ARP cache, and spanning tree and put all of that together to determine how do these two IP addresses talk to each other? Well, here's the PC. Looks like it's plugged into the Pino layer two switch connected to interface seven. That interface looks perfectly healthy. Now, when we say an interface is perfectly healthy, it means perfectly healthy according to all 19 error counters. That way we can give you confidence that it actually is healthy. What we found kind of sad is other products, if they say the interface is healthy, it means it's healthy according to only two error counters. You could have collisions going on there and just not know about it. Outbound on the Pino switch, it's going out through interface 25. That interface looks healthy. Looks like around noon there was some high utilization, but there's no packet loss and there's more bandwidth available, so that's a healthy interface. Inbound and outbound on the Sara switch looks good. Uh oh. Outbound on the Burgundy switch, we can see here right before noon, looks like it was dropping 6% of the packets. So since this interface was dropping that many packets, I'd say, yeah, it's definitely suspicious as to what was going on. So we can click into the interface, read the plain English prescription, and get the root cause of the problem resolved. Now, just because we found one problem doesn't mean we should stop checking. So we keep looking and find out that we're hitting the Santa Clara router, and inbound on that router, we're dropping, well, a tiny bit of packets, 0.25% of the packets. It's running 100 meg half duplex. Okay, well, that's bad, but it's easy to fix. We can also see outbound on that router, we have class-based QoS configured, and we have a high priority voice queue and a default queue. The problem here is that the high priority voice queue isn't taking any traffic. That means our voice tag packets are dropping into the default queue. That's bad. We can click in, it's gonna look at the queue, and we get to see that it's set for the wrong uh, uh, DSCP setting. It's looking for AF13 and it should be set for EF. One configuration change here to EF, and we'll start seeing this queue take some packets. Additionally, if any queues or, uh, packets are dropped out of the queue, we'll be able to see that as well. And if we wanna see how the queues are defined, we get to see the policy maps and class maps of how they were built. And this is all automatically determined based upon the fact that we can collect this information all via SNMP and say, here's what we're able to find so that you can start solving problems within the first hour of deployment. Other things we have for your NOC, we have a live updating uh, dynamic network map. So every five seconds, it's going to show you the live status of links, the utilization of links. So if a link becomes heavily saturated, you get to see that. 
We have an automatically generated network diagram. You can move elements around, lock elements in place, download to Visio. For all the devices, we have a lot more information than any other product, traffic levels, POE information, spanning tree information, full inventory information, make, model, manufacturer, uh, software version, serial numbers. Hey, uh, Tim, is there a find, find, find this Mac in my network or find yep. this IP address in my network? Right down here, you just Under put in a search and it'll find anything on the network. It'll mm -hmm. find uh, uh, DNS names, IP addresses, MAC addresses, MAC prefixes, a uh, lot of flexibility there. And, and does it show like the history of a MAC? Like it was over here and then it was over here and then it was over here? Or is so, it just showing you the, the kind of the now? It'll show where it is now or where it last was. So it mm -hmm. won't show six pieces of history. We do have that information in our database. We're gonna be updating the UI to include that, but it's not there yet. Okay. When, when you do that search, is it searching across all of the tables, right? So is it search across the config and, you know, all the other database tables at the same time? So like if I'm looking for like an IP address, will it show me, you know, it was in these routing tables, it was in these configurations, et cetera? It won't look into configurations or routing tables. So it's basically assuming you're looking for a device that is or was plugged into the network. Uh, switching topics a little bit to back to IPv6, um, I'm seeing all IPv4 addresses for communicating to the devices here. Um, now, you did mention that there is some v6 support. As far as the actual application is concerned, it's just you, know, you don't support v6 for actually looking into things. However, if I had hypothetically a IPv6 only management network, um, would I be able to tell Path Solutions, hey, here's my devices, here's their IPv6 addresses. Um, IPv6 only specifically is what I'm looking at. So if it's IPv6 only, we're not gonna be able to collect the information off of the device. So when we talk to a switch or a router, we do need an IPv4 address. Uh, other things we do, we do IP, uh, so we do device configuration management so we can automatically back up devices uh, on a set schedule. We can back up devices as soon as somebody makes a configuration change. If somebody makes a configuration change, we can send a diff email out and notify the team and said, Bob made this one configuration and added a static route to this switch. That way everyone is aware of that change that was made so it can be backed out if somebody goofed it up. We also have large scale configuration deployments. So if somebody says, I got a hundred lines of ACL that need to be deployed to all of the Cisco Nexus switches in the Chicago data center, that can be done in one fell swoop. Um, issues is going to show everything broken in the network. These are interfaces that are misconfigured, devices that are misconfigured, interfaces or devices that are buffering or dropping packets. And the trick here again is if you were given a list of everything that's broken in your network, you could spend five or 10 minutes solving each one of these problems so that by the end of uh, uh, the first week or two, you could say, gee, I'm no longer running a network that's full of mystery and unknown because you now know everything your network equipment knows. Last thing I'm gonna leave you guys with is our ability to predict things. We have two predictors. The first predictor is a cabling predictor. This is gonna show where your cabling is starting to go bad. What we do is we look for symbol errors. Symbol errors are a leading indicator of where a cable is starting to go bad because a symbol error does a single bit error correction to fix a physical layer error before it's passed onto a valid layer two frame. You have a few symbol errors, no big deal, but 17,000 symbol errors, you've definitely got a cabling issue going on. The good news is we haven't dropped any actual frames yet, but you can click into the interface and find out, oh, that's Bob's PC and Bob's cubicle. Let's go check it out and find out Bob's been backing his desk chair over his ethernet station cord five times a day. And the last predictor is, uh, lastly, uh, is our bandwidth predictor. We look at every interface in the infrastructure, find out which ones are the most heavily utilized and which ones are trending towards 100% utilization the quickest, and then give you a prediction date so that you know how close are you to actually running out of bandwidth so that you can always be ahead of the game. Hey, uh, Tim, do you, did you have a, a predictor on like transceiver failures? Looking at the, the DOM metrics, like transmit power, receive power, that kind of thing. So we are working on adding some more uh, predictors. Uh, and so that's something that we can add. 
Um, I'm actually kind of intrigued by the idea. So I'd love to have a, a deeper discussion with you later on that. Yeah, absolutely. Tim, this is Jerry. Um, do you have a way to prioritize all the issues? Uh, so the issues will come up. You can go through and determine which ones are high priority and which ones are low priority. You can suppress issues and say, this is not something I want to deal with right now so that you can go through and say, these are definitely lower priority issues. Okay, but it's a, a manual process or do I have some way that I could encode that and, and drop it into the product? So depending upon your, again, you're gonna have to make a decision as to what is important to you and what is not important to you. Uh, if you want, you can system-wide say, anytime we see certain error counters or certain error types, like for example, um, uh, um, if you see Apple Talk packets coming from a device, you can say, I don't care. That's fine. If it's an Apple Talk broadcast, it's going to be limited to that broadcast domain. I just don't care. So you can deprioritize that by saying, let's mask that off. Therefore, it's something that you're no longer going to receive a, 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 any sort of alerts or awareness of for that domain. Question. Was there a customizable alerting? I might have missed it. Like, especially sending something to a webhook, something like Slack, anything yep. like that. Yep, yep. So you can have customizable alerting with whatever fields you want to be dropped in so that you can include a, a rich information data set or you can include just minimal data set. So it's really up to you as to how you want that data set to go into, let's say, for example, a, a ticketing system or another system, an upstream si alert management system. Thank you. Tim, what's the, the way of getting new issues added to the product? Uh, I'm always open to, to taking input from uh, anyone on all sorts of new tricks, because I figure in one sense, I'm not going to come up with the best ideas. You guys are going to come up with the best ideas. Our customers come up with the best ideas. We just figure that's what the trick is, is to getting it into the soup so that this is able to benefit everyone. So if you have ideas, please feel free to send them to me. And how long does it typically take to get a new issue encoded? So depending upon the prioritization of that issue, because we, we have a lot of wishes, a lot of desires, uh, it could be two months if it's something that it's like, well, gee, we're, we're already so close because we have the data, we can do that in our, our next patch release, or might be six months, might be a year, depending upon prioritization. But it tends to be rather quick because we figure if we can solve some major problem by, by getting some of the low-hanging fruit solved, uh, then we can be really quick at getting those added. Tim, how do you guys do network discovery and do you have any type of mapping capability? So we will do network discovery based upon the subnet. So you can end up giving us a portion of the subnet. For example, if you say, in order to discover network devices, scan IP address one through 20. Anything that's above 20 is DHCP and would be a client, but your network devices would be one through 20. You can put in that subnet and say, scan this, find any devices, do this on a daily basis, anything that's new in that area, uh, we're going to go say, gee, there's something responding there. Let's go try uh, one of our known community strings that you've programmed us with, and we're going to try and talk to that device and then add it to the configuration automatically. Great. And do you do any sort of network mapping? So yeah, we do. Uh, I think I showed... Uh, network diagram. So we'll do diagramming like this. So you can end up seeing this is how the network is presented. Uh, you can zoom in uh, to areas. You can move elements around. You can lock elements in place. You can download to Visio. So everything needed for doing diagramming. Um, is that VRF aware by chance? It is. So the product is not VRF aware. Um, we have had a few folks ask about VRF. Um, so far, uh, we're kind of exploring the idea. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing the same with like uh, EVPN? Uh, correct. 